All right, we're back with another For Honor Realism Analysis after the Warden 1 did so well in my opinion. This time we'll be looking at a very popular hero amongst the For Honor community, the Centurion. Let's begin by saying that my understanding of Roman history is brief compared to my understanding of European Middle Ages. But like I always say, if you find something that might be incorrect, let me know. Please bring a source though as it makes my life incredibly easier than when just people just tell me, actually what you said here isn't true and it's actually this, and because I know I'm not always right I have to take it upon myself to look up the information that may or may not be correct, and it just takes up a lot of time that I'd rather be spending making these kinds of videos. Also I just like to read new sources. Alright now with that out of the way let's start off, I'm going to give a very brief summary of what a centurion is and what a centurion's role was to the Roman legion, hopefully in which way I can tie us back to For Honor. Okay, to start off in a very simplified way, Rome existed for a very long time. We're talking hundreds of years. To put this idea into context, the idea of the United States existing as a nation in of itself is only about 240 something years old. So if we compare that with both the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, we're looking at a civilization that spanned a multitude of centuries longer than some of the biggest civilizations that we have today. So just keep this in mind if at some point in the video I try to go into detail about late Republic or early Republic or late Imperial, early Imperial. Hopefully I won't have to, especially not in this one. It will probably come up later on in the armor section, but just remember that in hundreds and hundreds of years a lot can change and early Republic is going to look a lot different than late Imperial Rome. With all that being said, let's start with the beginning of the Centurion. It's the year 107 BC, the Roman Republic is nearing the end of its life, and the Marian reforms have just passed. This was to bring a group of changes to the Roman military brought by Gaius Marius, one of the changes being the additional role of a centurion. A centurion, or centurio in Latin, was a professional soldier of the Roman army. Their job was mostly to relay information to and from their chain of command to their cohorts. Though a centurion can lead their formation from any position they deem necessary on the battlefield, it is common to assume that they would fight alongside their legionaries and or lead from the front. Their role was to command and conduct their legionaries, and they did so by leading by example. It is also very likely to assume that when leading by example didn't work, legionaries that require discipline would not find much compassion with their centurion. This would make sense as a centurion that ruled with an iron fist would most likely instill fear amongst any that would commit any sort of treason or disobedience. That brings us to our next part, obedience is a critical factor when talking about the Roman army. This is mostly in part due to their reliance on one of the most successful tactics that they use for much of Rome's battles, the testudo. The testudo, or Latin for tortoise, was a shield formation that might be akin to a phalanx. Yes, I will talk about how phalanx is the name of his fourth feet instead of testudo, but I'll do that in part two, so you're just going to have to wait on that one. Rows of men would stand in formation and raise their shields to protect one another from any sort of projectile attack that might come their way, forcing the enemy into no other option but an up-close melee. With their sword and shield, known as the Gladius and Scutum respectively, they would be a nigh unstoppable force due to their sheer tactics, positioning, and strength in numbers. Now a key factor to making the Testudo work was the discipline and patience of the men in the formation. As for our Centurion in game, I don't think I would describe him as either of those. He's kind of more like... Let's just say that subtlety is not in his nature. That being said, it doesn't mean that he does not have anything in common with the armies of the great and mighty Rome. To begin, we're going to look at his stances. Just like the Warden, the Centurion has four stances within his three guards. Unfortunately, there aren't many accounts of Roman training, and the accounts that we do have come from writers than actual military leaders who personally train the men themselves. That doesn't mean that they are unreliable, it just means that we don't have any manuals with descriptions or techniques that state what stances were used and how they were used with their gladius, just like we do in the medieval era with written treatises. 
That being said, there is one YouTuber who very kindly arranged multiple sources together which really show how this sword would have been used. You may already know who he is, and he is very popular in the sword collecting and historical martial arts category. Scalagrim made a video a while back talking about the uses of the Roman Gladius, and I am going to just borrow some of his sources real quick to make my point. But I won't be going into as much detail as him, so I highly recommend watching his video. His link will be in the description below. In one of the sources from Flavius Vigetius Renatus, he states that the Roman soldiers were trained not to cut but to thrust with the sword, mostly because a stroke with the edges, though made with ever so much force, seldom kills as the vital parts of the body are defended both by bones and armor. On the contrary, a stab, though it penetrates but two inches, is generally fatal. That being said, there is a large importance in thrust rather than cuts, but that doesn't mean that it was exclusively that. In a description from Dionysus of Holoconarsus, holding their swords straight out, they would strike their opponents in the groin, pierce their sides, and drive their blows through the breasts into their vitals. And if they saw any of them keeping these parts of their body protected, they would cut at their tendons of their knees or ankles and topple them to the ground. What this shows us is that although they used their swords primarily for thrusting, a cut could be used if the need arises for it. You must be wondering by this point, formations, sword use, tactics, all of this can tie into For Honor Centurion? Yes, yes it can. When we look at the Centurion standing in his locked on position, there is something that looks different compared to the other heroes. Go ahead and take a guess, but you probably don't have the same answer as me, and if you guessed that it was his sword placement, you'd be correct. As you can see here, he puts his sword behind him instead of presenting it up front. Now, if you watched my Warden video, <coughs> shameless plug, <coughs> then you'd remember me talking about presenting the sword in front of you as a threat to oppose any advancing enemy. I think in this case, though, for Centurion, it was deliberate. Okay, tinfoil hat on, let's take a look at some other heroes real quick to see what they look like compared to Centurion. We have Conqueror, who has his weapon behind him, but his other arm is presenting a shield. That's interesting. Same thing with Valk, weapon held behind even if the point does go forward a bit, but especially with Valk in full block, you see her present her shield and put her weapon behind her. To really present my next point, we have Warlord. Look at where his weapon and shield are. Do you get what I'm trying to say with all of these? Pretty much any hero that isn't presenting an immediate threat with their weapon has something in their other hand to use, mostly in a defensive sense. I mean, except these two. But this guy isn't real, and... This is... whatever this is. So the reason I wanted to talk about all these Roman tactics like the Testudo and the history behind it is to bring us to the main point that I want to say. I think Centurion was animated to be holding a shield in mind. That or they just really wanted to model his Gladius fighting style along the ones that was originally used with the shield. You'll really see it after I show you these images I've created where I superimpose a shield over his lock on idol animations. Now I only did his top right and his side right idols since the other sides are just a mirrored version of those. And historically speaking, to make a Testudo functional, everyone needs to be in unison. That includes how they hold their sword. So if you were left handed, congratulations! You are now right handed, welcome to the Roman army. Now with all that being said, I personally think that this image I made is pretty spot on for what it'd look like for a Roman legionary who would be in formation. Now this is his side guard and I'd like to say why I placed his shield on him where it is. I specifically chose to place his hand to where the shield boss is. That is because of this finding which showed where and how the grip was on a Roman scutum. As you can see on this opaque version of the shields, you can see that his hand is a perfect height to hold the shield and still protect himself. Now I'll give some disclosure here, when sizing up the shield I kinda just eyeballed it to what I think the shield size should be or what I could see in recreations of a testudo. So keep that in mind for this next part because I didn't really get the measurements that correct for this one but I still think it gets my point across. Now it gets better and worse with the top guard, as we see here in the top guard I had a little trouble with the side shot and honestly I blame that to me not being able to size and warp the shield properly to him. Also, just like the Warden, he likes to shift around a lot so he might have just been looking down at the time. If we look at the front view of the top guard, it's literally textbook on how to hold a scutum. You can see that a majority of his face is protected except for his eyes, which is important because a real Roman helmet does not come with face protection. A legionary was expected to cover his face with this technique. Not just that, but also from this position he would be covering his entire body excluding his shins and feet, but those wouldn't protrude far enough out to be a target. And even if they were, if he was a centurion in the Roman military, he would be issued shin guards. 
Most other heroes in the roster don't look anything like this, and if Warden's idle animations taught us anything, it's to show us that Ubisoft is smarter than we think, and the idea that his exposed arm is meant to look like a shield would be there is not outside the realm of possibilities. He even holds his arm relatively still when walking forward, as if not to compromise his protection if a shield were there. I think it is most definitely one of the coolest and yet subtle things to Centurion, if not the whole game. What do you guys think? Do you think it's meant to hold a shield? Do you think they cut it from the game? Or do you think I'm crazy and it's not supposed to be that? Let me know in the comments below. To play Devil's Advocate, he might have his arm out because he's a brawler and needs to use it for grappling and all the brawling he does. Even then, I don't buy it. The resemblance is just too close to be a coincidence. Now that we've gone over how he stands, let's cover how he blocks and how he parries incoming attacks. So this section is going to be really short as there isn't much to say about it. For incoming heavies, he blocks them by just kind of reeling backwards like most heroes. You can see that he uses his forearm to brace himself a bit, and that will be more prevalent when we move on to parries. For light attacks, you can see that he braces himself with the forearm again, but once he realizes he's got the strength advantage in this situation, he expels the enemy blade away from him. Again, nothing really unique that I can say about this considering that it's basically what I expect UB would think of someone who is trying to block with such a small weapon. Lastly, we have parries, and like I said before, he blocks with the sword propped up by his forearm, and then he either pushes the sword away for side parries, or he does what he would do for a light block for top with the way he expels the enemy blade away. Let's move on to attacks now. For this segment, I'll be using Unreworked Centurion. Why? Because none of the core animations changed and most of the moves were sped up, which is counterintuitive what we're trying to achieve here. Also, Ubisoft didn't give me any sort of training mode with the new rework, so we're just going to have to use old Centurion. On to the actual gameplay. So when I talk about Centurion's attacks, I can't give you specific cuts like I did with the Warden. Again, longsword fighting was well documented and brought up as a sport in later centuries. Specific cuts and hues by Roman soldiers using their gladius was not. That being said, what I really want to cover is the practicality of some of these attacks, and also the attention to detail for some of them. Starting with the light and heavy attacks. If we look at the Centurion using his Gladius, we see something no other hero do on the roster. He exclusively cuts on light attacks, and then it stabs on heavies. Okay, the one exception is the zone, and I don't count the zone as a heavy, even though it comes up on the damage log as one. If you can't execute off of it, it's not a real heavy in my book. Back to the point at hand, even if we look at Valk, who uses a spear, yes, a spear, the weapon designed around primarily thrusting and has shown very few accounts of cutting successfully, even she stabs on lights and slashes on heavies. I, I know not all heavies considering the sweep, but just roll with me here on this one, okay? So why does Ubisoft make Scent unique in this one instance of a character? In my opinion, the answer is kinda simple. Symbiosis. The main thing they wanted when making the character was a character with variable timed heavies and the ability to pin on charged heavy, regardless of how controversial these decisions were. Realistically, they didn't want to do that with just slash moves because that would just look awkward. It also just happened to work out well how the Gladius was also used in real life. Now which one came first, gameplay design or weapon choice? I don't know, but I think it's a moot point. Chicken or the egg, it doesn't really matter because the conclusion is the same. This is probably the most important analysis of all of his attacks as it shows that using a realistic weapon in a way that is feasible to how it was designed is possible to make as gameplay. Granted, could it be more realistic? Definitely. And it's not for me to say whether or not it would detract from the gameplay or not. What I can tell you is this. From Centurion's stance to how he wields his sword, these were deliberate choices based off of the research done by Ubisoft on the history of the Roman army. In my opinion, there's too much evidence to prove otherwise at this point. Okay, I feel like I beat that dead horse enough, so I'll let that be. Honestly, there isn't much to talk about left, so I'm just going to go over a few minor things as quickly as possible, just because I feel like all the relevant stuff has already been said. For starters, as I suppose it is the most relevant, if we look at Sense Heavy Starter for right guard and top guard, we get a pretty good image of what a solid thrust would look like. Now if he stayed still a bit more and there was a shield in front of him, then I think this would be a great representation of a Roman legionary slash centurion as compared to Warden stances to his source examples we have. Just like Warden, is it perfect? No. But is it better than most other video games out on the market? Yeah, I'd say so. On sense triple light combo, it's fine. I mean, he really overswings for such a small nimble sword, but it's okay. And what I love, and I know everyone else loves, is twirling. The greatest tactical move of all time. No, 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 hear me out on this one. 
Imagine being so good that you hit an enemy with sense lights and finish his full light combo with just a little twirl just to BM the enemy even more. Outstanding move, such skill, such grace. All right, the punch. Everyone loves the punch. I love the punch. It has such a satisfying sound to it. Does it make sense to do it in combat? Well, I mean, if you have enough strength to guarantee to floor anyone that it comes in contact with. Wait a second, I'm sorry. Excluding Shigoki and Aramusha. Yubi do something about Rocksteady, why does it still exist? But if you had a punch that could floor almost anyone, then I'd say go for it. But here in reality world, I'd say it depends on the situation. There are many cases, even in longsword fighting, when you get into a scenario that you have to now grapple with the enemy, and a lot of people in Hema like to refer to it as wrestling at the sword. Obviously, Centurion being labeled as a brawler character, he's going to be doing a lot of wrestling with you. So I guess in short, yeah, you can punch the enemy, but if the enemy stabs you while you punch him, then who really won that fight? Even if you hit him so hard that you broke his nose or his jaw, you probably have internal bleeding. There's a reason why a lot of Italian longsword grapples end with a dagger into someone's squishy areas like their vital organs or their throat. Next up, the jump attack. A great way to lose your balance and not have any stability on where your attack is going, and also run yourself through on the enemy's blade, all in one swift maneuver. Remember guys, for the most part we can't change our direction mid-air and that means there's no tracking in real life. In a fight, keep your feet planted and strike with intent. It'll be 10 times stronger than any jumping attack you could possibly do. I almost forgot to grapple throw directions. They're all amazing except for the throw forward in my opinion. He kinda just headbutts the enemy? I don't really know. It just looks weird to me and also what is he grabbing on the enemy? For the enemy's scent it looks like his curious, but um... What if the enemy doesn't have one, like Nabushi? Oh dear god. What is he grabbing on Nabushi? Best to leave this subject before I violate YouTube's TOS. For back throws, he pulls the enemy forward and then gives him a little love tap on the back of the head. If you haven't ever been hit on the back of the head, more specifically by the blunt end of a weapon, then I can tell you with confidence that it is not a pleasant experience. Also again with the janky animations, it could be his back, honestly I don't even know. I don't think it matters as we all know the weight behind those arms. He rings your bell once and next thing you know you're on your ass and you don't remember keeping a sword blade in your chest cavity. But it's there now. How odd. For his right side throws, he just gives you a raw ass left hook. This guy just hooked you so hard that you stumbled out of his way. I don't even know if the punch hurt so much that it caused the enemy to move multiple feet away, or if the momentum transferred from the punch forced the enemy to physically move. It's like an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, but it's just an unstoppable force and an ordinary object. If you think that's great, left side throws get even better, as he literally just backhands the enemy away. The world's most powerful bitch slap. I mean, after they took away JJ's 5 points of damage on the slap. Yubi, bring back JJ slap damage. Seeing people kill with that thing is the kind of BM that I like, not 4 stack a stunning tap pelvic thrust over my lifeless body. Grapple into pommel strike and then repeated bludgeoning. I don't know if it's realistic, and not in the way of, I don't think someone who is still coherent enough to fight would sit there and take that. That in of itself is its own argument. No, I'm talking more in referring to the construction of gladii. Yes, plural of gladius is gladii and not gladiuses. And yes, I am very disappointed in that fact. Not to go too much in detail because I do want to make a part two where I do armor and weapons, but in short, when looking at a gladius, it could be an all wood hilt construction or a bone grip with wood pommel and wood guard. Overall, I wouldn't put it through a rigorous task of bashing it against someone's strongest bone in the body, the skull. Still a badass move though. The Legion Kick. Let's be honest, this was added so everyone would make This is Sparta memes when the character was released so it build up more hype for them so they could sell more. A kick like this is not really practical in a sword fight, mostly because when you're giving up that thing that we talked about earlier, balance, yeah, when you give that up, bad things happen. When in doubt, keep your feet firmly on the ground. Are any types of kicks viable? Oh sure, kicks have been around in all forms of martial arts. The key is when to apply them and use them wisely. Throwing your entire weight into a single kick is not a wise move. Alright, it's the moment we've all been waiting for, leaving the best for last, it's Eagle's Talon. Look, there's nothing realistic about this move, and if someone was on the ground, it would be much more efficient just to do what Scent does at the end of Inglorious End, or even the one where he throws the sword and just does a passing cut at the end. Again, in a real fight, you want to conserve energy. 
I'm fairly certain at this point Centurion isn't human, so he doesn't really have to worry about energy when he can just summon the life force of the Roman Empire as he flies across the gap between him and his enemy, plunging his sword through them. Alright, I think that wraps it up. If I left anything out, please bring it up to me. I tried to streamline this one a bit more because there was overall less important information to cover, and also I want to get this one done so I can start working on other knights, and maybe when that's done, start moving on to other factions. If there's anything I didn't cover in this, you can always ask in the comments as I usually give a response there. Just remember I am covering armor, weapons, executions, emotes, and ornaments in part 2. Also because people really seem to enjoy these kinds of videos, I would really appreciate it if you were to hit the like button as it will hopefully make the YouTube bot see this video and show it to more people. And feel free to share this video with your friends. If you like content like this and also like waiting, feel free to click the subscribe button. I can't guarantee when or what videos will be up next because it takes time to put these all together, but if you want to be updated on when these release, the way to know is to be subbed and with the bell button on. But with that, I'm going to end this video. Again, any questions, comments, concerns, prophecies, let me know in the comment section below, and I hope you have a great day. Peace.